Hello and welcome back to the White Pube podcast. I'm ZM and we've got another episode for you this week that is special, interesting, exciting content. Um, this week's episode is um, a recording from an event I did a couple of weeks back at Sirius, an art centre in Cove in Ireland when I was over there. It is a conversation between myself and Holly Marie Parnell, a filmmaker, a friend and just a totally beautiful person. Um, <laughs> this conversation between me and Holly uh, is mostly about a film Holly made called Cabbage and it is currently being shown at Sirius. So it's on until the 14th, the 15th of April. So you've got about two weeks if you're catching this on time um, to go see it if you want to. If you can't make it over, then no was that's what this podcast is for and um, hopefully we will do the best do our best in like filling in blanks and also giving you a bit of context if you haven't seen the film but this should hopefully just be like yeah a really interesting chat with a filmmaker and an interesting person so i'm going to really quickly give you a blurb for cabbage and then i'm going to play some excerpts um from the film so the blurb is from the Berwick Film Festival programme, where the film was recently shown, and it says that Cabbage is an intimate film made in collaboration with Parnell's family. Cabbage looks at the complexities of bodily autonomy within an ableist paradigm. Taking place in the months leading up to an international move from Canada back home to Ireland, a country they had to leave a decade prior due to severe, severe cuts in disability services, the film focuses on her brother David's writings using eye tracking technology and her mother's memories to explore how we shape a sense of self under the pervasive weight of unspoken assumptions and fixed definitions that get placed onto bodies. Dissecting layers of language, agency and power, the film is a subtle examination of how a human life is measured and valued. And the excerpts I'm going to play are coming up next and the first one is an audio clip from the film where David is using said eye tracking technology um, to address the camera. It's the same eye tracking technology that he uses to write and his writing appears in the film. I think this might be it from a clip where um, Holly is speaking to David and like they're having a conversation back and forth, but his writing also appears as texture and material that the film interacts with throughout the film. And then the next clip is from June, Holly's mum, sorting through medical documents and speaking to Holly behind the camera. And it's like a back and forth. Um, and then we'll get into the Q, the conversation, not the Q&A, uh, like the main conversation. And there are clips from David and Gabrielle who contributed to the conversation between, it wasn't just me and Holly chatting, it was also Gab and David, neither of whom were present in the room, but there in other ways. Uh, so yeah, hopefully this is interesting and hopefully you enjoy it. Um, I'll catch you at the end. Goodbye. I want to ask a question. 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 Tell me yes or no, I want to ask a question. Tell me yes or no, I want to ask a question. Yes, this is how I say yes, this is how I say yes, that's funny, that's funny, that's funny, this is how I say yes, that's funny, this is how I say yes. Change the subject. Do you want me to start filming? No, I meant something else. I'm going to start again. It's always quite interesting when you see these old, you know, professional notes about David, just, yeah, it's just so, so interesting how these are all, all just cap captured like this on a piece of paper, yet yeah, none of it uh, really captures the... These are all the documents that way back in 1990 when David first took ill, I mean, they're shortly after 
we were able to take him home and after having those just really negative conversations with some of the doctors about his future and and uh, sort of that kind of sense of just writing him off that I just felt no I need to get I need to get all the information possible so I'll take what they have and then I'll work with that and work with what I know as his mother and with him moment by moment, you know. These um, psychology ones are so... They have this testing scale and I mean, who are any of us ever fit onto a type of scale? I don't know how you can measure the essence of being human on a scale. But. Okay, so hello. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm going to open up by asking, I know we've just watched the film, but um, can you tell me super quickly what happens and what people can expect to see, listen to, think about? Because I'm aware that we're recording for people that might not have yeah. seen it. And also, just generally. <laughs> yeah, so this is a film that is basically a triangle between me, my mother, and brother. Me is the filmmaker behind the lens, David, and his words and writing that he uses, um, that he writes using his using eye gaze technology and that's threaded throughout the film kind of the backbone of the film and then um intimate conversations with my mother spent over a couple of years of collecting can you tell me a little bit how this film actually came together how did you make it what does your workflow look like and like what was the process of putting it all together yeah well this is the first actual single channel film I've made. It's funny speaking to you like this because you know my work <laughs> and you know so I get <laughs> but for anyone who doesn't I guess know um, this is my first single channel film so before that it's mainly been live video performances and installations that have always drawn on like loads of fragments using my phone as my main source of um, uh, recording device so, yeah and so for me, I've al I'm always like collecting, whether it's field recording, like sound, or just like fragments of little things happening. Um, that's like how I work. And then I suppose, and this is also the first time that I like upgraded to like a nicer camera, I suppose. And that was decision was purely because I was filming so much indoors as well, and there was like literally details of words on a page that I wanted to capture that like the phone couldn't do so I was thinking I should probably learn how to use an actual camera and so it was interesting so the process of bringing in a bigger camera was more like how can I make this feel as much like my phone as possible mm. and as much like because the phone basically felt like just an, another appendage that was really easy to collect things because it didn't interfere with like the intimacy or the, the authentic authenticity of the moment because like cameras are like bodies right and so when they get bigger and they can change like the atmosphere of a space so um i was always trying to figure out how to make that as small as possible um i actually completely forget your question I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> no that, the question was rubbish compared to what you just said <laughs> you just, i don't know where i'm floating no ignore the question but you said something really interesting about how cameras are like bodies can you tell me a bit more about that yeah well, uh <laughs> That was no, that was like the best thing I've heard all month. Like, <laughs> no, no, but they just they have their own energy and they have the, they affect people are act different in front of them, whether they enjoy to be in front of it or are scared of it. And it's interesting when I was learning how to use a nicer camera, I suppose I was like learning on all these YouTube channels and all these like mainly men on the YouTube channels teaching cinematography and they were, it was all about how to make your rig bigger and how to expand your rig and so that when you go in on set, you're like, look more professional because your rig is bigger. <laughs> and it was just, I could not find like any 
YouTube channel that was uh, like the, the inverse of that. Yeah, so I would just take what they were saying and try to inverse it and learn of like how could I make my setup as small as possible to create that like so it could be a body that just felt like an extension of my hand as well mm -hmm. and especially in because I work in terms of like collecting I think this is the beginning of where your question actually was from is how I pieced it together but it, because I work in collecting fragments and just I always have to have some sort of recording device because I don't like to set up a scenario I like responding to one that is like something exciting is happening and there's a resonance and I think oh gosh this has to be captured and that can only be done when something's on you all the time so that was a learning curve in terms of how to um, bring that into that um, relaxed environment mm -hmm. yeah and um, but like how long did it take you to collect the footage that makes up this film like um, from start to finish a year and a half Whoa. Yeah, and it and it was because we were in the middle of this move, hmm. and also I, the move back to Ireland was more of a contextual background thing that I wanted to include in the film that was just more placed the characters within that context, within that shifting context. But there's also something um, when you're looking at this subject matter it wasn't like oh I'm just looking at this one part of the story or this I kind of wanted to look at like all the different layers and I just felt that they're <laughs> them being bat like batting back and forth like ping-ponging twice because of like cuts to disability services it's mm. just like this absolute absurdity that like <laughs> I wanted to include but just to have it in the background rather um, so that's what kind of started the films like my mom was literally going through old things and deciding what to keep and give away and I was thinking and it was yeah mm. so that's like background and also like inciting incident that kind of oh I never thought of that an inciting yeah. incident no no yeah yeah maybe this is like writer brain like <laughs> kicking in like no but Gab Gabrielle, Gabrielle and I <laughs> talk about like story structure all the time mm. um, yeah. so yeah maybe that's the inciting incident yeah not to narrativize it, <laughs> not to turn it into like some big grand narrative. Um, but everything has story. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Not, it doesn't just exist in narrative or film. It's like even this moment will have a start and an end. Hmm. And it doesn't I, have to be. And a climax and a denouement. Yeah, not necessarily linear. <laughs> It's, I love that, yes. Okay, so this is not just like a Q&A in combo, this is a multimedia presentation um, because Gabrielle isn't here, David also isn't here, and we are going to play some clips from both of them in conversation as well as us having a chit-chat now. So there's a question from Gabrielle for David, but I'm going to ask you it of you now first. Oh, okay. Um, what is your favourite bit of the film? Um, Jesus. Um, Quick fire. Oh my God, think fast. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> this is a uh, difficult question, I think. <laughs> probably the reason why the film's called Cabbage. I like that scene with my mum, just where she's like, um, there's just something powerful about um, her revisiting those documents and being mm -hmm. like, fuck them. And... <laughs> And you, she's only in that place of like power and resilience because of time and because of living such a long, you know, she's in her 60s and has lived a long life with this, in this situation. So I think like the fact that she was like, time becomes a material in this as well because she's like looking back and being able to analyze something from over 30 years ago. And I think that like time is powerful in that scene for me. Yeah. Ooh, that's a good answer. That was... Hmm. Okay. Oh no, I accidentally just changed the file name. Okay. Hello to the audience. I'm not in Cove, unfortunately. I'm in bed in Liverpool with COVID. Um, but I've got some questions for David and he's already answered them. So question number one is, what was your favourite bit of the film? Through my eyes. Through my eyes. Uh, 
I just want to ask you a question now off the back of David's answer. Um, and I don't know if I'm reading between the lines or like inserting subtext that isn't there. Um, but are there parts of the film that you had to shoot through, not your eyes or your camera, or like a camera as your eyes, mm. um, but through his eyes? Like, did you have to vacate your perspective and enter into a completely different space? Um, what was that yeah, like? Yeah, no, I quite literally did that. Like, I took the lens and I would, like, follow his eye movements. <laughs> I don't know mm. if that's way too literal or not, but I just felt um, it was far more interesting than just like filming him experiencing mm. a moment but how to really use a lens to like to, and like film as a medium to its capacity to be able to like inhabit try and inhabit someone else's perspective mm -hmm. yeah. what was that like though because you're not just a filmmaker you're also david sibling like what was, did did that feel like those two categories collapsing into each other or like was there like a clash or how did that feel? I think because I'm the sister and the daughter and the filmmaker hmm. it allowed me obviously access but not just access but time spent in, in the minutiae of daily life where these nuggets of wisdom like seep through in really casual ways and I think for me that is the space of the real and that is what I'm like always trying to tap into when I'm making something so it was like such a gift to be able to make a film with people I'm so close to because of that mm. does that make sense absolutely like it feels like mm. it's that um bridging the distance right like filling the space between that makes yeah that makes sense That's yeah because people would think I've had that question before, like, oh, you're so close. How did you find, how did you create then the distance needed as a filmmaker? I was like, I, I don't believe in needing distance mm. as a filmmaker. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Um, I wonder, though, if those are the bits that feel like a collaboration. Maybe then this is a smooth segue into talking about <laughs> this film as a collaborative work. Um, yeah. Are those the parts that feel collaborative? Yeah, um, like I was saying to you earlier, like the film feels like this triangle, like between the three of us. And if you take one part of it away, it would just collapse and not be the same thing. Um, and I think that's really important, especially um, with giving David his voice, and not not that I'm giving him his voice, but like elevating the way he speaks to an audience. It was absolutely necessary that it wasn't just um, my project or my gaze, but um, like really, really equal, you know? Yeah, three different voices speaking, I guess. Yeah, I, I re really, really do feel like I was just the filmmaker there with the camera and made the editing choices and David was there with his words creating like the backbone of the film and my mum's like memories and the way she speaks was like like really powerful and that's all just words coming her out of her mouth and I'm just there with the camera. Um, yeah, so it hundred percent felt like a strong unit. Mm. Not like yeah. Yeah. So. That's maybe then this is a better segue into talking um, about David's writing because I've got some questions. Um, maybe first I want to ask about how his writing is technically or practically facilitated. Um, can you tell us about the eye gaze software that he uses? Yeah, so the eye gaze software, it um, tracks his retinas. So it picks up the movement of his eyes and essentially works like a mouse, like if you were on a computer and, that, and using your hand, but his eyes would just um, be that mouse tracker. And then if he holds his eyes on either a letter or a pre-made word for a certain amount of time, then that comes up. And then his fastest way of communicating is through pre-made sentences. So he does use that the most. And um, he does type words as well, but it takes much longer. But a lot of the poetry and things that he writes are made of these pre-made sentences. And I, yeah, I kind of love that, like what he's able to do with what he has, 
with what's already been made, what he's able to say in those in those pre-made lines. Mm. That is a good segue into <laughs> Gab's, Gab's question. second question. Bear with me while I faff. <laughs> My second question is that I find that I communicate quite differently if I'm typing on my phone versus my laptop versus speaking to someone face to face. Um, And I kind of want to know how David thinks this technology, the eye gaze technology, shapes his communication. Like, can he write in his own phrases, for example, or is it all chosen by the machine? Uh, Does he find himself thinking faster than the machine or is it okay? How does he feel about the automated voice? Um, and apologies if this is too many questions in one. It's just something I've been thinking about in terms of like the parts of Cabbage where David repeats himself when he speaks, which I imagine he doesn't just do for the film, but does on the daily. Like it allows him to spam a message in a way that um, we don't do with our mouths. And I just think that's a, it's an interesting quirk of the technology. I want to talk about it. 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 Oh, oh. To who? To who? 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 Well, no, maybe it's a question for you as well because um, I know everything. I'm a snooper, and I <laughs> caught a clip of you talking about having used the IGA software yourself. Um, so maybe there's something that you can speak to in your experience as well. Yeah, I mean, as a family, we've all like tried it just to be aware of like what it's like for him. And it's like <laughs> incredibly difficult to use and incredibly tiring as well and a bit frustrating because you have to like focus so hard and then mistakes are made and you have to like look away quickly before it does the wrong thing. And it's um, so he doesn't just use it all day long and have it all the time it can be a frustrating tool and i also find that interesting this is just one mode of communication um he has lots of other ways to communicate non-verbally like through facial expressions and sounds and that's how we've communicated with him as a family like our whole lives up until he started learning this technology so we're fluent in his language um so it's, it's just interesting now that um with this new technology people are like oh oh my god he's communicating how i find that another interesting layer of like um him having to like prove his humanity in a way that this sort of helps people even um get to that place which is not even shouldn't even be necessary but we're just like oh i can understand that word okay oh that's something i hear yeah so that's interesting to me as well, that tension. Mm. But because it's clunky and awkward as well at the same time. Yeah. And his language with us that's outside of that framed system is much more fluid, in my opinion. Yeah, that was something you, you were talking about earlier, that it kind of exists within framed system, this framed system, and it kind of, it's this other entity or this other material that has to be fit in, it ha- that it has to fit into... Yeah, mm-hmm. the requirements of this this software that obviously mm-hmm. has like a designed user experience and outcome in mind, right? Mm-hmm. Like the, mm-hmm. mm, I'm going to play a third question now from Gabrielle and an answer from David. Question number three. In terms of bodily autonomy, has David's relationship with medical professionals changed since beginning use of the eye gaze technology? i.e. do they treat him less like the title of the film because of his language now and I ask that because so last year uh, my nan was in hospital for about six or seven months 
and she had a stroke and the doctors were telling us to you know get ready she was she was probably going to die um but while she was in there over the course of of a few months um she suddenly regained the ability to speak and the theory is that when she was in there they took her off the antidepressants that she'd been on for a few years and suddenly she was like coherent and it meant that even though physically not much had changed besides this coherence and this new language that had returned to her um the doctors suddenly decided to like take her seriously and move forward with treatments that they'd held back on because they seemed to say that you know they they'd written her off they'd given her the cabbage treatment um and then when she could speak again they like gave her an operation and she was able to actually come out of the hospital and she's like still here today and yeah it just has made me think a lot differently about language and respect and how dark that can be um between doctor and patient I know it I like that I know it I know it I know it I understand I know it Hi I'm gonna It's nice having Gabriel's ghost here It is <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk about the ghost because oh, I'm yeah, convinced this, <laughs> this place is haunted. I'm convinced. I saw a ghost last night. Not to segue, but <laughs> I'm convinced <laughs> I saw a ghost last night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the downstairs that's, that's, is well known. Yeah, yeah. It's haunted. So many ghosts. Oh my God. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Multimedia presentation <laughs> between <laughs> us and the spirit world. <laughs> Right, to t- to just want to shift gear now, rather than talking about language and, like, capital L language as well, like, all caps language, explicit, like, hard and fast language. And maybe talk about some nitty-gritty filmy bits, because filmmaker, ooh, um, I want to ask, a, well, this is kind of about language and film, this question. I want to ask about how David's writing sat against the visual content that you shot, and, like, maybe how his writing related to the footage can like was he writing first and you were responding to it or was he responding to the bits that you were shooting and like I don't know was there a bit of a back and forth well it's hard to like pinpoint because I'm always filming like I actually have to like apologize to my loved ones because they're just the camera's always on um and not not in like an artistic sense always maybe in a home video sense just it's always there so I don't I don't know in like the hard line of like when I but with his writing I I suppose that came first because it was that writing that made me um that actually inspired the project because I don't know if other people feel this but when I see David's writing it feels like it has an outward projection that he's asking the audience like it creates the viewer it creates an active relationship with the viewer as if, as if these questions are for the viewer or maybe they're for no one or maybe he's just speaking to like um, it, like what you can't even put your finger on. And I, I always think about that too in terms of like these knowledge systems that get made or these like authorities, like even the people my mom's like talking about, like you sort of can't even pinpoint where the, that like power is coming from. Mm. Um, but yeah, so his words, either they sort of feel like soliloquies in a way you know in a in theater when the actor just stops and starts to like talk to the ether and then um that felt like a really nice moment to me that um that inspired the film and then what the things that I wanted to film and knowing that I didn't want to just like film it as in document it but really try and get like um somatic with my filmmaking and my relationship with like his words mm. so that it could like move beyond just um, a space of pure language and be trying to communicate something a bit more in terms of like the body yeah mm. that's can you say more about that like the um 
the sum, I don't know if somatic is like a an adjective. It normally, but like, like, the somaticness, <laughs> like, that's not a word. <laughs> Can you speak more maybe about the somatic quality that the film takes on? Like, is it? I guess, like the moments that I had spent with David, I I try to like tap into what is the experience of that moment. And for David, I think there's when he's in that space, because he's in this body that is always being stared at and equally always ignored. Um, so he's hyper aware, and I think his writings are hi like hyper aware of the, of the body and what that means to inhabit a body that is different. Um, and when he's in these, his favorite thing is to just be in nature. And when I think about that like more deeply, I just think that like it's a place where he doesn't need permission to just be and to just exist um, and to, to have to prove anything. And I think that's a space of somatic miss. <laughs> somaticness. There, there must be a word for that. Like it, it, the, <laughs> somaticness <laughs> isn't a word, but there must be a word that I'm missing. Um, can't think of it. Answers I guess somaticness is like feeling connected beyond language. That's how I feel like it. Mm. Connected to the nature universe or connected to like the world around us without having to use words. That's yeah. what it means to me, but maybe I have the definition wrong. No, no, maybe it's about a groundedness that like kind of like that cerebral headspace of like language and um, like, things that you can understand verbally. Mm. That's really cerebral and like above our heads. But like the opposite of that probably is, yeah, that groundedness that you're speaking to. Mm. Yes. <laughs> this is really just a process of me understanding things. <laughs> um, Dictionary.com. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, and there's, okay, so this isn't a clip from Gabrielle. I'm going to now enter her headspace. No, I'm, I'm going to become a ghost and Gabrielle the ghost is going to possess my body. I'm going to ask this question <laughs> as Gabrielle. <laughs> Um, she says, I don't think this film, this is a film about disability. It feels like a film with it. I don't mean that to sound like an arty, silly term, but more like a lot of art with disability as its subject matter is a bit like, wow, look at this person. Aren't they horrific or inspirational or educational? And that doesn't feel like the invitation here. It feels more level. Now, she's, this would have been a clip that's more like a comment than a question, but mm, I want to no. offer you... Yeah, no, I like that because this isn't a film about disability to me. This is a film about ableism. Mm -hmm. It's asking people to question this ableist paradigm that we're in. So I'm not looking at like, uh, like him being really inspirational um, or it being sad. Like, sh sure, like all these things exist in that constellation, but the film is not about that. The film is about the space where you reclaim power in this system that's like quite suffocating. Hmm. So yeah, I like that she tapped into that. But not, yeah. yeah, not like identifying that. Um, I then want to ask a question for you about maybe filmmaker like head on. Were there choices that you made to engage with the subject of your film in a way that was maybe more careful, more tender, more... Um, and I'm, I'm like, that sentence is worded in a really cold, like, <laughs> technical way because I'm saying, like, subject, engage, mm -hmm. um, choices even. But, um, you know, the subject of your film is David, your brother, and like your yeah, mum. Yeah. And do I, you think. Yeah, yeah. sorry, do you, do you want to finish what you're. I just no, 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 it's gone. <laughs> no, but I, I'm. Um, I, when I was in Barrack a few weeks ago, so this film called Acarante by Manuel Munoz Rivas. I think I've butchered it, but um, and then his Q and A after I just like really his words really resonated with me when he said that filmmaking for him is a gesture of love, and um, and he likes to film the people in his life that he loves almost to like save them from the erosion of time and that I, not that that is that relevant but this thing about gesture of love is like 100% how I feel about filmmaking like I'm really not there's a lot of shit to like critique in this world and especially in the art world we kind of hang on to that like space of like 
the things we want to share that we feel are wrong with the world, but I think we can talk about that from a space of love as well. And like, I want to choose to like film and be with subjects that like offer something to this world that is in a space of like joy as well and love. Mm. And that being like a, a political position as well. That makes that's, sense. That makes absolute sense. And that's really profound as well because I, I feel like at the moment I've really been thinking a lot about who we monumentalize or um, like the act of like documentary or like image making, like who, who, who gets to be like um, documented and how that happens, right? Yeah. That, that feels like it, it, it contains potential to be a space of like tenderness, care, love and all these other, and maybe maybe saying like, oh, you know, this is an act of, I feel like the word care has been like a real curatorial buzzword. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> I, you know what I was thinking the other day? I was thinking like, for the white pew bingo, you guys have done do an curatorial. artist statement bingo? Yes, or, or I know. bingo? Well, like curator bingo, because well, I feel get like get somatic in there, <laughs> get a slippage. Policy. Policy. There was a year, there was a, I think it was 2021. Care. Curators were like, just would not stop talking about policy, policy, policy. And it's like, <laughs> I'm interested in policy, but not anymore. You've made it in like pedestrian. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, we should. Right, note to self, cut that bit out of the recording. No, I'll keep it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it as like a, yeah. <laughs> but um, that, yeah, that, um, I think that yeah, the care kind of often turns into aphorism, right? Or like tweet. Like it, it turns into like a Twitter word that you can just throw out into the world, world and like expect that it kind of hits someone as a shorthand that everyone knows what you mean. Mm. But I, I don't know, like it kind of has real tangible meanings and like you're doing a real tangible thing by like documenting someone and that, that's the act of love and like remembering, right? Mm. And like depending on like what angle you focus on, care can be really disabling as well. Like if you were to like, I made obviously had those conversations with myself to like not show any like physical care side of David's life it just wasn't necessary yeah and these all feel like specific choices that you made through mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah you mentioned something earlier and um it was about um you said something about how you opened only with like really tight shots of David's like, like th those shots outside in mm. oh yeah yeah um his, yeah yeah like I wanted to make sure in the beginning of the film and I had these conversations with David as well that I didn't we didn't want to just make that easy for the audience to just open the film and be like this is a film about a boy in, in a, wheel, a man in a wheelchair um, it was important that David was able to like confront the audience with his words first and you even see like the surrogate body of like the wheelchair which is another body in and of itself before you even see David in it. And I think that was important for David as well when we had these conversations um, that he felt like he had some control over like the narrative because he's also playing with people's like in my opinion his writings are playing and speaking to people's subconscious as well so even though we're like no no I don't, wouldn't actually think that it's like there's stuff in our subconscious that we haven't even learned to unlearn yet that I think he's wanting to play with yeah. yeah, that's oh, I um I have a question. It's not a question. Maybe I'll pull like put a pin in it. But like what you said about how his writing kind of engages with the subconscious, or like, mm, th there's not a question there. That's more of a comment than a question. <laughs> Maybe I'll come back to that. Um, are there other films or filmmakers who you've looked to as um? Not inspiration, inspiration in that, like, oh my god, inspiration way. But, mm. like, have you taken cues from other filmmakers or, like, other bits out in the world? Um, well, you know this, but mm. my favourite filmmakers, Kyle Kapadia, and I think, I, I don't know, it's funny, the inspiration, because I, yeah, I think anyone who's works in a certain way will always like find their orbit of people that are also like on that wavelength but you're not necessarily like making things in the same visual language but it's just your approach to like even like Jonas Mekas like I adore this man who recently passed away but he's a Lithuanian filmmaker who used to just 
film, everything. He was from Lithuania, but lived in New York. Um, and just that approach that he used to say, like, I'm, I'm not a filmmaker, I just film. And then, so this approach to just collecting, collecting, and like the collecting, the minutia, like every day, as being like, it was quite powerful. But I, I too, when I look at Payal's films and her short films and the way she, she said this thing that was really interesting. Um, she said that the short film's like a haiku and that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And I think she does that really brilliantly where she um, is quite confident the way she'll only like reveal a few things in such a short space, but create this like really profound, heavy and whole piece. Um, and I think that's inspiring for me. Yeah. I mean, I could talk about who my favorite filmmakers are, but I don't think it would be like, oh yeah, that's where I've gotten all my, I think for me, it's like filmmaking's like really, really intuitive. Like the decisions come from like a really like gut place. And I always feel like even when I was like younger, when I was trying to emulate, if I was trying to emulate someone else, it was just absolute shite. So I feel like people make the best work when it's like, you almost like it's come from nowhere but your gut. Hmm. Yeah, it's that someone, I can't remember who, someone recently in vague proximity of me, in my earshot has said something about how, it's that thing like, um, say like, Maria Lasnik, right? Like, she's really good at being Maria Lasnik and like, trying to, that, that act of emulation, you're never going to be as good at being Maria Lasnik as Maria Lasnik is. <laughs> because she's Maria Lasnik, you can't, you can't compare, but you you can like, do the best version of being yourself and like, that, yeah, that impulse, it's located in the gut, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, you should never want to be anyone mm. but yourself. <laughs> 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 so true. <laughs> it's cliche, but it's true. I think it is, especially with making. And like speaking about the camera as like a part yeah. of your body or like an appendage. But yeah, and anything you make too, like everything, not to sound like a hippie, but everything has like an energy. So you can like tell too when something's been made and it's not being authentic to itself, or it's trying to be something else, or it's trying to do that, or sort of, you can like feel that, like the, like the person experiencing that can like feel exactly where that thing, in what kind of like space that thing has been made. Mm. I, I believe that anyway. I yeah. feel that when I approach works, that I can like feel. <laughs> no, but is that something that like- How it's been made. Is that like a logic that runs in and around your own work? Like when you're approaching like maybe the process of like sorting clips and figuring out a nice order mm -hmm. for editing because it sounds like that's a very separate process to shoot in. Yeah, and, and when I'm like, ex like experiencing other work too, like the thoughts of like, is this good or bad never goes through my mind. It's just like, do I believe this or not? That's a much nicer yes. question to ask yourself as well. Right? Yeah, and you have to ask that of yourself as well. Yeah, I've never thought of it that way, but yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh my God. We're learning so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, oh, actually, speaking of learning then, what have you learned in the process of making this film? Um, like, is there learning that you would take with you or leave behind into the next, as you go into the next project? Someone asked me this at the last screening. In was the it audience. Gabrielle? <laughs> I don't remember now. I think it was. But actually, don't didn't know what to say and I still like don't really oh know no what she's bamboozled you twice again, I think it was again, Gab she's <laughs> done it twice to me um I mean it's fine if like it's it's because maybe then the answer is like that that learning process hasn't quite it's not kind of come to I think I learned how to make a beginning and an end because mm -hmm. it's the first time I've edited like single channels before then it's like been installed like the loop really really like invested in the loop so not to make something that like existed in a time loop was like um difficult but how to like still make it feel like you've just dropped into a space and then been pulled out and allowing that to have a beginning and an end was um a great learning thing for me That's and learning new things. equipment and all that but that shit's boring so don't no, want to talk no. about that no no because i think like that technical um that technical question really affects the the way like not just like the way that the output looks but like the feel of it right like no that's that's learning you can definitely <laughs> take that Gabrielle will not bamboozle you again <laughs> um, she's like you didn't learn your lesson the first time <laughs> and then she's got a question for David yeah um, this is a nice one to end on yes question number four and my final question uh, is 
when I was at Berwick Film and Media Arts Festival with Holly uh, two weeks ago, Holly mentioned that after the film was shown in Cork Film Festival, that someone has approached David since then to uh, talk about publishing a book. So my question is, what's going to be in the book? Um, what what can we what can we expect? What I see. What I see. What I see. Seeing. Looking. Touching. Hello, it's me again. I'm back, but not for long, um, because that's all. Thank you for listening. Uh, there is a bit of an abrupt end in there. Apologies for that. But um, yeah, that, at that point in the event, we opened things up to questions from the audience. And I'm not actually legally sure whether we're allowed to use that recording, even though the question, you know, GDPR and all that. But it's a shame because the questions were really good and Holly's answers were obviously really good as well. So apologies to you. I'm basically just telling you about something that you can't hear. But um, it's, take my word, it's great. <laughs> Thank you to everyone that came on the day. Too serious for the event. Thank you to Miguel Amado for getting us back to chat to Holly. And thank you most of all to Holly, who is just, yeah, so generous and thoughtful with her answers. Really, really, like... It's, it's always just a dream to talk to an artist who knows what they do, is willing to think out loud about what they do and, yeah, really engage with the questions put before them. Um, I remember actually having a chat with um, HP before um, before the Q&A, before the co- in combo, before the event, and um, I was, like, kind of running through the questions, like, oh, some of these are a bit bad, that's a bit of a boring question, but, you know, and Holly went, oh... Um, no, there's no such thing as a bad or boring question. Only like bo- like bad or boring answers. Like if someone's taken the time to actually engage with your work and think about it enough that they ask you a question, that's like amazing. You should thoughtfully respond to that. And I wish I was that generous. I really do. Because sometimes I find myself getting like tired with questions that I ask and also questions that I am asked. And um, yeah, I just wish I had that kind of generosity and patience. Like it's just, yeah feels like an admirable quality or something that oh ow I just hit my hand um feels like an admirable quality but also a quality that makes yeah thinking about or around the work um or just art in general like art and filmmaking in general it just makes that a real pleasure to engage with so hopefully this has been a useful episode of the podcast hopefully you've enjoyed it if not ah well there's always next week let's see <laughs> thank you for listening see you next time goodbye